Welcome back to Digital Systems 2. In this video, we're going to discuss the TTL logic family and some of its characteristics. By the end of the video, we're going to discuss a number of things related to the TTL family, and that includes some of the commonly used parameters from data sheets. We're going to go over the um, data sheet operating characteristics of a logic device. We're going to talk about the internal circuitry. We're going to determine loading and fan out and um, how do we apply some of these characteristics to the design of a digital circuit. So before we can begin to discuss <clears throat> the TTL family, we need to go over some basic terms or ideas. And we're going to begin with the idea of input voltages and output voltages for any device. So if you think about a circuit, whether that circuit has AND gates, OR gates, NAND gates, NOR gates, whatever it has, we have inputs and we have outputs. And we know that the output of, for example, an AND gate or an OR gate, um, whatever the case may be, we know that an output is either going to be high or low. It's either going to be zero or one. Um, but we have to put some more bounds on what exactly a zero or a one is. So, for example, one of the parameters or one of the terms that we're going to discuss today is the high level input voltage. This is the minimum voltage level required for a logical one at an input. So if you look at the picture down here, think about this inverter. And it has a, a high level input voltage, meaning if this NAND gate is going to send an output voltage to the inverter, the output voltage has to be at a certain level in order for the inverter to interpret that voltage as a one. So it's the minimum level required for a logical one at an input. So for example, if this NAND gate were outputting 0 0.9 volts, and I need at least two volts here to consider the input high, we know that the NAND gate is not sending a voltage high enough for the inverter to receive that voltage as a high input. So that's your high level input voltage. You also have your low level input voltage, which operates off of the same concept, except now it represents the maximum voltage level required for a logic low at an input. So using the same example, let's say that we have the output of a NAND gate connected to an inverter. If the NAND gate is sending a low signal at its output, that voltage must be below a certain point in order for the inverter to interpret that signal as a low. So, um, for example, an inverter may only be able to interpret a signal as a low if that input signal is 0.8 volts or less. If the NAND gate happens to be sending a signal that's 1.2 volts, the inverter will not interpret that input as a low. The low level input voltage represents the maximum level that an input can receive and consider that input a logic zero or a low. So that covers the inputs. We also have the same idea for outputs. The next term is the high level output voltage. This is the minimum voltage level a logic circuit output can be in order for that output to be considered high. So again, thinking about the NAND gate here, in order for the output to be considered high, there is a minimum level it must meet, usually around two volts. So if this voltage level coming out of the NAND gate is below that, it will not be considered a high output. And then we also have the low level output voltage, which is the base, basically the same concept. So it is the maximum voltage level that a logic circuit output can have to be considered a logical zero or a low. It cannot go above this maximum level. So those are our four concepts for voltage. We have our, our low level output voltage, our high level output voltage, our low level input voltage, and our high level input voltage. And then we have the same four ideas related to current. So we have the high level input current, the low level input current, the high level output current, and the low level output current. And these values represent the same idea that we discussed previously with voltages. 
So for example, the high level input current is the current that flows into an input when a specified high level voltage is applied. The low level input is the same concept except when a low level voltage is applied. Your high level output current is the current that flows from an output in the logical one state. And then your low level output current is the current that flows from an output in the logical zero state. So we have these eight ideas or concepts for output voltages and input voltages as well as output currents and input currents. And we have to understand how each individual gate will produce a current and a voltage because once we connect one gate to something else, we need to make sure that the output of one gate is appropriate for the input of the next so that if the NAND gate outputs a one, the inverter will interpret that as a one. So we have to understand these terms in order to understand how our gates work together. Another term that we're going to discuss today is propagation delay. You've probably seen this before in Digital One. Just to refresh, it's um, we have two propagation delay times that are defined as your delay time going from a low to a high, and then your delay time going from a high to a low. And we can see in the picture how those times are measured. Your time that is measured going from a high to a low is here, and then going from a low to a high. That's your propagation delay times. Generally, we look at propagation delay, especially when we have a, a, a switching characteristic, like a flip-flop, something that will switch its output very rapidly. Um, propagation delays might be used to determine, for example, the delay in a counter using flip-flops. Every IC requires a certain amount of electrical power to operate. You've already noticed this because during lab, if you were to um, take some chips and put it on your breadboard, if you don't supply power and ground to each one of those chips, nothing happens. And um, so every IC requires a certain amount of electrical power to operate, ju just to function. So typically we supply power to our VCC input, which is right here. Some devices have it labeled as VBB, but they're both the same thing. For many ICs, current drawn from the power supply, now that's the supply on your board, on your breadboard, that current that is drawn varies depending on the logic states of the circuits on the chip. So when we think about putting chips on a breadboard, keep in mind that you're connecting each chip to your power supply, your five volt supply. And that supply is going to have a limit on how much power it can deliver, how much current it can deliver. For example, one supply may not be able to drive a million chips. It may only be able to drive a hundred chips. Something you might need to know when you're designing a circuit and you have to include a power supply. So in order to figure out the power that is going to be uh, drawn from your chip, you have to know the current drawn. And we have two basic ideas for how current is drawn from the supply. The current drain on the VCC supply when all the gate outputs are high, is called I underscore CCH, I -C -C -H. Again, that's how much current is drained from your power supply if all your outputs on your chip are high. Then we have the same concept when all of your outputs on your chip are low. So we have these two ideas of the current drain when all outputs are high, the current drain when all outputs are low. We use these two concepts to create the idea of the average current drain on your power supply. <clears throat> and the amount of power that an IC requires is determined by this average amount of current. So we take these two values, add them up, divide by two, and this average amount of current is what we're gonna use to figure out the amount of power that your IC requires. So taking your average current, we're going to plug that into your basic power formula, which is that P equals I times V, or in this case, your dissipated power is your current times your VCC, times your voltage supply. Now these are going to be average values because we use an average current. So when you're using a chip, depending on how you're using it, you may not know exactly how many outputs are going to be high or low at one point in time, so we take an average as our best guess. A 
of what kind of current is going to be drawn. And once we take that average current, we plug that in to get an average power dissipation for that particular IC. So let's say that I have a chip similar to this one in the screen. It's got three NAND gates on it. Each NAND gate has three inputs and I have three outputs. I might need to know, well, how many of these chips can I put on a breadboard? How many of these chips can I connect to a power supply? In order to know that, you need to know, well, how much power does each individual IC require? And this is how we would calculate that. And then you would compare that to the amount of power your power supply can deliver. So another term um, that we are generally going to discuss when it comes to TTL devices is the idea of noise. And noise comes from stray electric or magnetic fields that may be in the surrounding area of where your circuit exists, and it can induce voltages on the connecting wires between logic circuits. This noise, this induced voltage caused by the environment around us um, can cause unwanted signals and that can also cause your circuit to behave in an unpredictable manner. So whenever we design a circuit or design a system, we try our best to account for at least some system noise. And noise immunity is what we use to refer to a circuit's ability to tolerate noise. And when we think about the idea of tolerating noise, think about wiring a circuit where you might have the output of an AND gate connected to the input of an OR gate. And we know that that AND gate has to supply either a zero or a one to the OR gate, but what if there's system noise that affects the output? How can we ensure that the OR gate can still receive the correct signal it was intended to receive even if there is system noise? And we sort of define what this noise immunity uh, can be using noise margin, noise margin. So we have two concepts for noise margin. We have high state noise and low state noise. And we have two basic definitions for high state noise and low state noise. And this image right here is really going to help you to understand the idea of noise. So let's first start with high state noise. Let's assume that this diagram on the left represents a driver, like an AND gate, and this represents a load, something that's connected to the driver. The driver, the, the output of the driver is an input to the load. Let's say that the driver supplies a minimum high level output voltage. Let's just say, for example, maybe that's like two volts. We want to make sure that the high level output voltage that comes out of the driver is high enough that the load will interpret it as a one. Now, if there is noise in the system, that could cause this voltage to go higher or lower. If this voltage goes higher than its minimum value, that's okay because it's still going to be perceived as a one, even if this voltage goes higher. But what if there's a negative voltage spike, which caused this voltage to go lower than we want it to? So what we want is to make sure that the load can accept something slightly less than what we expect the driver to provide. And that difference in what we expect the driver to provide and a possible spike which would cause it to go lower is called our high state noise margin. So if we think about the driver and the load, there's like a small window of error here called our high state noise margin, meaning that our driver is supposed to output a certain voltage that's supposed to be high enough for the load to receive it and say, oh, I'm being sent a logic one right now. But if there's some noise that interferes with the signal and causes it to drop a little bit, there's a small window here where the load will still receive that signal as a logic one, even if the voltage output goes down a little bit, a slight drop. We call that the high state noise margin. And how we calculate that is we take the high level output voltage from our driver and subtract the high level input voltage for the load. There'll be a difference between these two. And that difference tells you how much this high level output voltage could potentially be reduced 
but still be seen as a logic one by the load. The low state noise margin is defined as <clears throat> this formula right here, and it's slightly different. So now think about our driver is outputting a voltage that must be perceived as a low signal by the load. So if this voltage coming out of the driver is low enough, the load will say, oh, I'm receiving a logic zero. But let's say there's a spike that causes this output voltage to go higher than expected. If it goes too high, my load won't receive that signal as a low. So there's a little bit of margin of error here where we can see that if the output voltage for the low state goes slightly higher, we can still have the load receive that signal as a logic zero. That's called your low state noise margin. And that's the difference between your low level input voltage and your low level output voltage. So we subtract those to get a, a difference, and that is your low state noise margin. So the low state noise margin represents the amount of positive voltage spike that your low level output voltage can have, and the input that's connected to that output will still receive that signal as a low. So for proper operation, you never want your circuit to have an output that ends up in this indeterminate range. If that happens, you don't know what your load is going to do. You don't know if the load is gonna receive its input as a zero or a one, and that'll affect the output of that load. So you never want your, your driver to output a voltage that's too low to be considered a high, or that's too high to be considered a low. That's where you end up in this range here and you have an unpredictable output that's going to occur in your circuit. So it's important to know how these valid voltage ranges for the logic family are used so that you can identify, um, trouble, when you're troubleshooting, you can identify an error. So as you're building your circuit, if, you, if you're not getting the output you expect, something you may test is, is the output, is the output voltage high enough to be a high? Is the output voltage low enough to be a low? If not, you, might, you may have identified a reason why your circuit is not working properly. So now we'll, we'll do a quick example. So the input and output voltage specifications for the standard TTL family are listed below. We're gonna use these values to determine the following. The maximum amplitude noise spike that can be tolerated when a high output is driving an input. And then our maximum noise spike that can be tolerated when a low output is driving an input. So these are the two things that we're going to um, discover. Keep in mind, I've been using this term TTL throughout the video. You should have heard this term before in Digital One, but if not, imagine um, TTL is the name of the family of logic devices that we use. Think about going to the grocery store. You might go to Publix, you might go to Winn-Dixie, you might go to Walmart. All three stores have food to fit your needs, but each one has a slightly different uh, presentation, slightly different variation in how they operate, but at the end of the day, they all have food that you need. TTL is just one family of logic devices. So when we go to the lab and we build a circuit using an AND gate or an OR gate or a NOT gate, we're using a TTL device. There are other manufacturers with other, with other characteristics that are slightly different than TTL. And so today's lecture, we're just talking about this family of devices, the TTL family. So that's what I mean when I refer to TTL. In the next video lecture, we'll, dis we'll discuss another type of device that's not TTL. So you can see some of the difference. Anyway, back to our example. So first, let's discuss what will happen when an output is high. When an output is high, we're going to look for the high level output voltage, which is going to be right here. So when an output is going to be high, it must output at least a voltage level of 2.4 volts 
uh, in order for it to be considered a high. That's the minimum. It's got to be 2.4 volts or higher in order for that output to be perceived as a high. Now, if we look at the, the minimum voltage that an input needs to respond to a high, we're going to look at the high level input voltage and see that right here, that's 2 volts. So what does this mean? This means that an output can, out, have, can have an output of 2.4 volts or higher for that output to be considered high, but the input only needs 2 volts or higher for the input to be considered a high. So there's a difference here of 0.4 volts. That means I can have a negative voltage spike of 0.4 volts. So if there's some noise in my system and my high level output voltage decreases a little bit, it can decrease by as much as 0.4 volts and the input will still receive that signal as a high because the input only needs 2 volts and the output is going to provide 2.4. So there's some wiggle room of 0.4 volts here and that's your high state noise margin in this case. And then we're going to talk about the low state. So when an output is low, we're now going to look at the low level output voltage the low level output voltage, which is right here. Your maximum low level output voltage. So when an output is sending a low signal, it cannot send more than 0.4 volts. But now we're gonna look at how the input responds to a low signal. In order to do that, you look at your low level input voltage. So an input can receive a voltage that's 0.8 volts or lower, and it will receive that as a low. Your output is only going to send something that's 0.4 volts or lower. So there's some wiggle room here of 0.4 volts, where this signal coming from the output can actually spike up a little bit. There could be some interference that causes this 0.4 to go up a little bit. And as long as it doesn't get bigger than 0.8, your input is still going to receive this output signal as a low. So the difference between the two is our low state noise margin. And here's a summary of these two noise margins that we just calculated. And again, use this picture as a reference. When we're calculating noise margin, all we're asking ourselves is, is the output for the high state going to be high enough even with a little bit of system noise? And is the output in the low state going to be low enough even with a little system noise? That's what we're calculating here. And again, just imagine that you have a circuit. Perhaps it's an OR gate driving an inverter. It could literally be anything. You have a load and, and a driver. That's all we have. Just at, what we're really asking is whether the output of the driver is high or low, will the load receive the correct input, the input that was intended, even with a little system noise, with a little system interference? That's what we're doing when we calculate a noise margin. Next, we're going to go on to two ideas that happen uh, when you have uh, TTL devices connected together. And one, one of the ways that we describe how logic families work or operate is by how current flows between the output of one circuit and the input of another. So we have two main ideas. And imagine that we have a NAND gate connected to another NAND gate. The output of one NAND gate is the input to another NAND gate. We have two basic ideas. The output of the driver is either going to be high or low. If the output of the driver is high, it's going to supply current to the input of the load. So this is gate one, this is gate two. If the output of this NAND gate happens to be high, meaning we have to apply a low signal and a low signal to the input so that the NAND gate has a high as its output. If the output is high, what we have is current that flows from gate one and into gate two. We call this current sourcing. The driver, the driving gate supplies or sources current to the low gate in the high state. Current sourcing. So when the output of a gate is high, we have current sourcing. 
it's different. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's a, a breakdown of how that works. Um, a TTL output acts as a current source in the high state. Now, what's really going on inside of a NAND gate is you have a series of resistors, transistors, and diodes. You'll learn more about these types of devices in the semiconductors course if you decide to take that course. But this right here is just giving us a little peek as to what's going on inside the NAND gate. And what actually happens is here's your 5-volt source. That's like your VCC. You have a flow of current here, and this transistor is like a switch. The switch will either be on or off depending on whatever inputs are applied here. In this case, it's a NAND gate. So when you apply a zero here and a zero here, you have a flow of current that flows out of your, uh, out of your output and in to the input here. This is your load. So again, when you have a high output, we have current sourcing, or the current from your load, I'm sorry, the current from your driver is supplied to your load. Now, in the low state, something very different happens. In the low state, we have what's called current sinking. Current sinking. And in this case, the driving gate receives, and we call that sinks, current from the load gate in the low state. So if the output of the NAND gate is low, we have a different scenario where current will actually flow back out of the input from the load gate and into the output from the driver. We call that current sinking, current sinking. And so we have to keep these two ideas straight because in one case, we have to consider the current coming out of here driving an input here. In the other case, we have to consider the reverse. That current flows from the input back into the output. And so as we're evaluating whether two devices are compatible, can I connect the output of one gate to the input of another gate? As we're evaluating that, we'll have to remember that if the output is high, current sources. If the output is low, current sinks. And that's gonna affect how we view and attack um, the compatibility of different devices. Again, this is a snapshot as to what's going on inside of the example I showed you previously. We're inside of the NAND gate. We have a series of resistors, transistors, and diodes. And when we have a low output, current literally flows through here, just like this, and back back into the output from the driver. If you've never seen a diagram for the input of a NAND, or, I'm sorry, the inside of a NAND gate, this is what it looks like. This is the whole picture. And up until now, we basically have given you a symbol and a truth table and said, when you see this symbol, here's the truth table. So for the AND gate, the OR gate, the NOT gate, every gate you know about right now, you know its symbol, you know its truth table. What you don't know is what that symbol really represents. It represents an electronic circuit that operates based on the truth table. So as we get further into your study of electronics, we're going to remove the idea of the symbol and tell you what's going on behind the curtain. Now, we're not really going to do a lot of analysis on the um, electronics and the calculations that go behind how this works. Again, that's for the semiconductors class. But here's just a, a sneak peek at what's coming. Now we're going to start to understand why does the NAND gate give me a high or a low, depending on these inputs. Why does the AND gate do that? It's all based on the internal circuitry that relies on resistors, transistors, and diodes. So just in case you've never seen this before, this is what's really going on inside of a NAND gate. Here are your two inputs, and your output is taken right here. So now we're going to move on and talk about data sheets. The example data sheet that is in your notes and that is on the screen is for the 74 ALS00 NAND gate. It's a NAND gate. And your data sheet is going to give you a lot of information as to how that particular IC will work. So some of the terms that we've been discussing so far, like your high-level input, 
voltage, low level input voltage, high level output current, low level output current. All of that information is supplied via a data sheet. So these are some of the parameters that you'll be able to see on a data sheet. Notice here, your VCC, your supply voltage, can be as low as 4.5 and as big as 5.5, but it nominally, or your, your preferred value is five volts like we do in our current labs. So take a minute to look over the spec sheet and familiarize yourself with some of the parameters that are provided. Notice your switching characteristics give you your transition times, your propagation delay times, I should say, from high to low and low to high. And you have a minimum time and a maximum time measured in nanoseconds. Notice here you have two slightly different part numbers. So you'd really have to specifically look at the part number you're interested in to know which numbers to use. These are both NAND gates with slightly different parameters so they have slightly different part numbers. On the next page of the data sheet, you'll just see a few more characteristics that are provided. For example, the current draw on the supply in the high state and the low state is provided here. You have your low level input current, your high level input current, your low level output voltage, your high level output voltage, so these are all the different parameters that you might see on a spec sheet. And as we go about calculating something like noise margin, here's where you would have to go to find some of the data you need to calculate that. So now we're going to do a quick example. We're going to refer to the data sheet for the 74LS00, and we're going to determine the maximum average power dissipation and the maximum average propagation delay for a single gate. So take a minute right now and see if you can figure this out on your own using the spec sheet provided. And then when you're ready, check back in for the solution. So first we're gonna find the average power dissipation. You wanna look under the electrical characteristics to find the maximum current draw in the high state and current draw in the low state. Those are gonna be 0.85 milliamps and three milliamps. Let's go back and find those. Your maximum draw in the high state and the low state is right here. Add those together and divide by two and you get an average of 1.9 milliamps. Next, your average power is obtained by multiplying by VCC. We're gonna go back to the data sheet and determine what VCC is. Notice that for these two calculations, the test conditions used to come up with these numbers are right here. The VCC used was 5.5 volts per piece. That's the VCC you're going to use for your power calculation. So you're going to do power, which is equal to current times voltage. You're going to do your average current multiplied by your voltage. And if you're wondering why would I use 5.5 and not 5, let's assume worst case scenario. We know we're supposed to supply 5 volts to VCC, but you can supply as much as 5.5 safely. So let's assume the worst case scenario that you apply a little bit more voltage than you intend to, so we can figure out exactly how much power could be dissipated in the worst case scenario. This is how we get an average power dissipation of 10.45 milliwatts. Keep in mind, that's the power drawn by the whole IC, the whole IC. The chip itself has four NAND gates, so we can divide this by four to figure out how much power is dissipated per gate, per gate. And again, we use the maximum voltage value here in order to get an idea of what the worst case condition might be. So if you, um, if you use these worst case uh, or your, your highest maximum voltage, you come up with the idea that, well, in the worst case, I'm going to draw 2.6 milliwatts per power. It might be less. If it's less, that's fine, but you can have a contingency for the worst case scenario. Next, your propagation delay is going to come from the chart as well on the first page. Here's your propagation delay. 
So you're going to grab your values, your minimum and your maximum values, which in this case we're doing the 74ALS00. So grab the propagation delay times for the ALS and you'll have 11 nanoseconds and 8 nanoseconds. Add those together, divide by 2 to get your average propagation delay. Your average propagation delay. So that'd be 9.5 seconds. Next, we're going to use the table below to calculate the DC noise margins for a typical 74 LS IC. How does this compare with the standard TTL noise margins? So when you think about the TTL family, your standard TTL family has a part number that begins with 74, just 74. That's the standard TTL family. Then there are derivatives of the standard TTL family. There's the 74S, the 74LS, the 74AS, the 74ALS. There are different derivatives. They all are within the umbrella of TTL, but they're different families with slightly different functions. Maybe some have a better propagation delay. Maybe some have a better noise margin. Um, each one has different characteristics that can be used for different uh, things. So what we're going to do is compare the noise margins for the 74LS IC to the 74 I see. So we're going to calculate our high state and low state noise margin for the 74 LS as well as the 74 and compare to see which one has a better noise margin. So again we're going to do the 74 LS, the 74, we're going to calculate our high state noise margin using these formulas and compare. So with the 74 LS to do the high state noise margin, we need to find the high level output voltage. The high level output voltage for the 74 LS. So you're going to go to this column. You're going to find the high level output voltage right here. You're also are going to find the high level input voltage right there. And subtract them. That gives you your noise margin in the high state. You're going to do the same thing for the low state. So you're going to take your low level input voltage and subtract your low level output voltage. There's your noise margin in the low state. Now we're going to do the same thing for the 74. So with the 74, we're going to be taking our high level output voltage minus our high level input voltage get a noise margin of 0.4 volts. And in the low state, we're going to take our low level input voltage minus our low level output voltage and get a noise margin of 0.4 volts there. Now let's compare. The 74 LS has a wider margin. I can have a larger fluctuation or I can have a little bit more noise in the high state with this chip than with that one. This one is slightly more flexible because I can account for a wider margin of error. And then the 74 would be slightly more flexible in the low state because its margin is 0.4, while the 74 LS is 0.3. So uh, this is how we would calculate your, your noise margins and then do a comparison. The wider the margin, the more uh, noise you, your system can handle. Next, we're going to move on to a new topic called fan out. Fan out. So, fan out comes from the idea that a logic circuit output is generally required to drive several other logic inputs. Think about the output of a NAND gate being connected to five other things, or the output of an OR gate being connected to 20 other gates, that single output being connected to 20 other gates. Fan out refers to the load drive capability of an IC output. How many gates can one output be connected to and then drive them all effectively? So that's the idea of fan out. Again, I have one output. How many other inputs can be connected to that one output without risking the efficiency of our system, without risking how we affect the system to operate? So uh, one thing we have to keep in mind is that a TTL output has a limit on how much current it can sink in the low state. 
or how much current it can source in the high state. Exceeding these currents will result in output voltage levels outside of our specified ranges, and we don't want to be outside of our specified ranges for high and for low. So to determine fan out, what we have to consider is all the high level input currents for every input connected to an output. So if we have 20 inputs connected to one output, each one of those 20 inputs needs current. Can the output supply that current? And then when we think about the low state, we need to look at every single input current in the low state and ask ourselves if the low level output current is uh, as higher than that number. Because in the low, low state, we're gonna be sinking all of this current. All of the current from every single input is gonna be synced back to the driver. This current value right here is gonna tell you how much current can be synced. And we don't want all of the current coming from every single input to be more than the amount it can handle. So that's what we're gonna consider when we calculate fan out. So now let's do an example. The question here is how many 74 ALS000 NAND gate inputs can be driven by a single 74 ALS000 output. So in this case, we have exact same part number, 74 ALS. The output of one 74 ALS is going to drive a number of other inputs from the same family, the same part number. I want to know how many. How many outputs or how many inputs can I connect to this one output? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to determine, based off of the current flow, whether uh, what, what that number of, of inputs is. So first, we're going to consider if the output of the 74 ALS is low. If the output is low. So we can see that the low level output current for the 74 ALS is eight millimeters. Low level output current, 74 ALS. This is the maximum current that can be synced. So if I connect this output to, to a number of other inputs, the maximum level of current that can be synced back through that output is eight milliamps. Next, we're gonna look at the low level input current. Low level input current, 74 ALS right there so if I connect the output of one NAND gate to the input of another I can expect that one input to sync 0.1 milliamps back so here's the question now how many 0.1 milliamp inputs can be driven by the 8 milliamp output another way to say that is how many inputs can I connect to the output and uh, and not go past a total current sink of eight milliamps. So we can do eight divided by 0.180. I can have 80 inputs connected to this one output because 80 times 0.1 will give me eight milliamps total. So I can drive 80 other inputs with this one output because when I think about the current that's gonna be sunk, I can, it, it's only 0.1 milliamps. It's way less than the 8 milliamps that I can tolerate. So I can to tolerate quite a few inputs connected to this one output up until I get to 80, 80 inputs. I can, I can have 80. Now let's do the other case where, what if the output is high? Consider a high output. So now we're going to be looking at the high level output current, the high level output current, which is right here. 0.4 milliamps. And then we're going to look at the high level input current. High level input current. 20 microamps or 0 0.020 milliamps. And we're going to ask ourselves the same question. How many of these 0 0.02 milliamp inputs can be driven or can be connected to a 0.4 milliamp output? And to do that, we're just going to divide. 0.4 divided by 0 0.02 is 20. It's 20. So when we consider fan out, we have to consider the low state and the high state. 
If I have a NAND gate connected to another NAND gate, if the output of the NAND gate driver is low, I can have 80 inputs total connected to that one output. If the output of the NAND gate is high, I can only have 20 other NAND gates connected to that output. So usually when we determine fan out, we go with whatever is lowest and we say that the fan out of this particular scenario would be 20 gates. That way you cover yourself in case the output is high or low. If you know the output is always gonna be low, you could say 80. But if you want to be versatile, we pick the lowest number. So the fan out of this particular scenario will be 20 gates total. 20 gates is the, is the final, final answer. But we can't get that answer until we consider the low state and the high state. Let's do another example. The 74 LS NAND gate output is driving three 74 S gate inputs. Notice we have different part numbers here. 74 LS and 74 S. So we have three 74 S gate inputs and one 7406 input. Using the data below, determine if there is a loading problem. Loading meaning a fan out issue. So our question here is if I have the output of one NAND gate, that output is connected to four things. Three 74 S gates and one 7406 gate. Is that going to be a problem? Is there going to be enough current to be supplied to these four other inputs? That's the question. So first, we'll consider the high state. Let's assume the output of our NAND gate is high. So that means it's going to be sourcing current at this point in time, and we want to know if enough current will be sourced to drive three of these inputs and one 7406 input. So we're going to look at our three 74S inputs and grab the high level input current. High level input current is right here. And we have three of them, so we're going to multiply that by three. And we're also going to look at the high level input current for the 7406. It's right there. So the total current in the high state for these three inputs would be 50 micro times three. 40 micro times 1, 190 micro. So our NAND gate needs to be able to supply at least 190 micro for these four gates. The question is, does it supply enough? Does it supply enough current? So let's look at the high level output current for the 74 LS. High level output current for the 74 LS is right there. 0.4 milliamps or 400 micro. So we only need 190 to be supplied. The 74LS is gonna supply 400. It's gonna supply enough current to drive all of those outputs and have some left over. No problem, no issue in the high state. That's how we would consider this, this uh, particular part of the problem. Now we're gonna consider if the output of our NAND gate is low. If the output of our NAND gate is low. So now we're going to be looking at the low state input current for the 74S, low state input current for the 74S, and we have three of those. And then we're gonna look at the low state input current for the 74, add that up. We get 7.6 milliamps. The low output current for the 74LS, low level output current for the 74LS, right here is eight milliamps. So here's what this means. In the low state, 7.6 milliamps is synced for the four inputs listed. That means 7.6 milliamps is sent back to the output. And I can accept as much as eight milliamps. No problem, no problem here. If these four inputs were gonna sync back more current than this eight milliamps, then we would have a problem because uh, in the low state, that's when syncing occurs and we want to make sure that the current that is synced back to the driver is not higher than what it can accept. So our next topic is unused inputs. On any TTLIC, all of the inputs are ones, which is a high, if they are not connected to some logic signal. 
An input left unconnected is said to be floating. It's said to be a floating input. We never really want to intentionally leave a floating input. And here's an example of this. I had a student once who was confused because he had an OR gate on his breadboard. He had nothing connected to pin one or pin two. So both of the inputs had no wires connected, had nothing connected. But if he connected pin three to an LED, the LED was on. And he said, how can the output of this OR gate be one when both of the inputs are zero? And I had to explain that the inputs aren't zero. You have unconnected inputs, which are interpreted as ones. That's why you're getting a high at the output. You always want to be aware if you're using a TTL device that uh, floating inputs will always be perceived as a high. And this could affect the output of your circuit if you didn't intend to leave something open. So you always want to try to connect a, uh, an, open, uh, an open pin to power or ground, or an unused input can be tied to a used input just so that it's connected to something. Um, and, and depending on your circuit, you'll want to make sure and do the, the Boolean algebra to make sure it doesn't change the way your circuit works. Um, but you want to connect it to something, whether you connect it to five volts, whether you connect it to zero, whether you connect it to another input, you never want to leave something floating. So now let's talk about how we consider fan out and loading when you do have tied together inputs. So in general, the general rule is that if you have two or more TTL inputs on the same gate that are connected together, you're still going to count like the current, for example, that the, the input level current that might flow, like in this example right here, I'd have one, two, and three instances of that current. I'd, I'd count it as three like, separate values of current that would be flowing here. But there are two exceptions to that. If you have an AND gate, if you have an AND gate, and only in the low state, will tied together inputs be treated as a single input. You don't count them separately. So we have a big caveat here. It's only for NAND and 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 only in the low states. But you'll have this concept where uh, if you have tied together inputs, both these two inputs count as one input in the low state, but they count as two inputs in the high state. So that's a little caveat to, to remember when you're doing fan out. If you have tied together inputs and you have a NAND or an AND gate. So let's do an example of this. We're going to determine the load that the x output right here, is driving in the figure below. Assume that each gate is a 74LS series device with your high level input current being 20 microamps and your low level input current being 0.4 milliamps. So in this example, we're given a part number, 74LS. So we're going to be looking right here at the values in this row. And we're going to consider the high state and the low state and figure out the load on uh, at point X, which is the current that's got to be driving all of these inputs. So let's start with the high state. In the high state, gate two has two inputs. Each one of those inputs is going to get 20 microamps because that was the... Uh, the specification given, and we can see that in the table as well. In the high state, the high state input current is 20 micro times two gates, I'm sorry, times two inputs, will be 40 microamps that has to flow this way. Gate three only has one input connected, so that's going to get 20 micro. And gate four, gate four has one, two, three, one, two, three inputs connected. So it's going to get 3 times 20 micro, which is 60 microamps. And in the high state, this is your load at point X. You need 120 microamps total to drive these two inputs, this one input, and these three inputs. That's the high state. Now we're going to go to the low state, and we're going to remember two things. First of all, in the low state, current sinks. So we're looking at current that's going to flow back into gate one. The second thing is that our NAND gates 
if they have a tied together input, this now counts as one input instead of two, and it's only for your NAND gates. So gate two, this is gonna be treated as one input. The low level input current is 0.4 milliamps. So that's the current that will be synced in this, in, uh, from this gate, gate two. Gate three only has one input, and it's going to sync 0.4 milliamps in the low state. And gate four is a NOR, it's not a NAND, so it doesn't apply to the special caveat I presented earlier. It still has three inputs that are gonna sync current. And those three inputs are gonna sync a total of 1.2 milliamps, three times 0.4. So in the low state, we have two milliamps total that is sunk from all of these inputs. And that's how we apply that little caveat when it comes to tied together inputs and fan out or loading. And that is the end of this video covering the TTL family.